will go to the book of Exodus, chapter number 1. Book of Exodus, chapter number 1. And if you would like to follow along, I did put an outline on the back right-hand side half sheet there, if you'd like to follow along on the outline there. And I will pull my computer out, and we'll get that uh, up here on the screen momentarily. Our series that we have been going through is on Bible characters, Bible characters. And uh, I have enjoyed uh, personally going through uh, these various Bible characters. And tonight we will look at the Bible character, the individual known as Miriam. Who is Miriam? Well, Miriam is the sister to Aaron and Moses. And she is a testimony of faithfulness. I was trying to think of a way to describe her, and uh, you'll see there on the outline that I refer to her as a responsible sibling. I know it's not the uh, most creative title, but uh, she was a very responsible sister, and uh, that's the, uh, the highlight in Exodus chapters 1 and 2. So we will go to Exodus chapter number 1, and of course, we know this is a time of slavery, of bondage for the children of Israel. And they continue to increase in number and population. And the Pharaoh was very cruel to the, to the Israelites, to the Hebrews. He increased their work. Verse 13 of Exodus 1, And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And even as they afflicted them more, we see in verse 12 that the Hebrews, the Israelites, multiplied and grew. So what is Pharaoh's next attempt to try to reduce the population of the Israelites? Well, what do we see in our own culture? What do we see going on? What does the devil often resort to as he influences, as people in power and leadership turn from God? What often happens? We turn from God and we begin to murder and kill, we begin to abuse those who are made in God's image. So we see it in our culture just as we see this Pharaoh, we, we see this Pharaoh here in Exodus 1 doing something that is extremely cruel. But we look at our own nation and we look around the world and we see the spread of abortion the murder of innocent children in the mother's womb, and we have a whole political party now that has as its platform the murder of unborn babies, even down to the very last minute partial birth abortion, or even some who are saying, leave the baby on the table and let it die even after the child is born. So we look at Pharaoh in Exodus 1 and we say, how could he go to this level to say, kill the male babies? Well, we think of Satan, who's a murderer from the beginning, and the father of lies. It's no surprise that when men turn from God, that they resort to murder. They re resort to the execution of those who are made in God's image. So we come down to verse 15 of Exodus 1. The king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Ship. Shifra, in the name of the other Pua, and he said, When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him, but if it be a daughter, then she shall live. So, who does the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, get involved? He, he asked the midwives. And we've seen in, in Nazi Germany, where the average citizen was asked to do the work of the Nazis, and to betray the Jews, and turn them over to the authorities. We are seeing the pressure right now in America as nurses and doctors are being put under pressure to perform abortions or not get certified or lose their license. There's even now a movement that is so perverted that we have nurses and doctors that are being put under pressure to perform mutilating surgeries upon boys and girls. 
And if they don't do it, they can lose their license, they can lose their jobs, they cannot get certified. This is where evil regimes go. When man, when those in leadership turn their backs on God, reject the word of God, they resort to all different forms of evil. And what does the Pharaoh do? Hebrew midwives, betray your own people, kill the sons, let the girls live. And we go down in verse 17, but the midwives feared God. Praise the Lord for those midwives. We've talked about them before, and God did, uh, God did not honor any lying or deception. I don't believe the midwives lied or deceived. I believe that they just simply made it possible for the Hebrew mothers to give birth to their children and the Hebrew midwives just showed up late. And by the time they got there, the Hebrew mothers had already taken care of their, their baby boys. Um, I think that there was a way in which God gave strength to the Hebrew mothers and gave wisdom and uh, gave those Hebrew parents the, the resolve. And we know that Moses' parents, Moses, Aaron, Miriam, we know that their parents... Jochebed being the mother, we know that they did not obey the command of the Pharaoh. And we read here in verse 19, And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered, ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives. God blessed them. And the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass... Because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. So he honored them. He blessed them. And Pharaoh, verse 22, Exodus 1, And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. So he got frustrated. The midwives were not completing the job as he wanted them to. So now he's commanding the Hebrew parents to toss their baby boys into the river, the Nile River there. But verse number one of Exodus 2, And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. So, of course, she did not obey the command of Pharaoh, obviously being a God-fearing Israelite. And obviously, a mother gives birth to her baby son. What mother is going to want to take that baby and chuck that baby into the river to die, to drown. Obviously not. That would go against the very nature of the mom. But of course, they were God-fearing people. They were not going to obey the command of Pharaoh. This is a point where you obey God rather than men. And we have nurses and doctors and people in other places of employment today who are under pressure in the areas of abortion, transgenderism, um, other, other types of employment, there are people who are refusing to create websites, refusing to take flowers and put them out for a same-sex wedding, refusing to make a customized message on top of a cake to celebrate a perversion of God's ordained design for marriage, and they are suffering for that. The website designer, I forget her name, that is before the Supreme Court and probably will be ruled on by the end of the month of June. And that is a not just a speech, First Amendment speech, but that's also a religious liberty, the ability for us to exercise our faith. As the founding fathers intended, religious liberty means the ability for us to exercise our faith in the public square, not just in the four walls of our church. And what we do on Sunday or on a Wednesday night. And here they fear God, they obey God, they hide the baby Moses for three months. And then we see in verse 3, And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. So she makes a basket, makes it waterproof, puts it in the edge of the river, obviously, with the bulrushes. In verse number four, and his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. So 
here we see Miriam introduced. And we see her obedience and her wisdom. She helped her mother hide her baby brother from Pharaoh, who had decreed the death of all of the baby boys, the newborn boys. And when it came time to hide him in that basket in the Nile River, she is the one who was given the orders by her mom to stand by and to watch and see what happens. No doubt, mom and dad are back praying, asking God to preserve the life of their child. No doubt, there are many other moms and dads who are similarly praying, begging for God to have mercy to prevent the Egyptians having obeyed God and preserving their baby boys alive. And here is Miriam being the responsible sister, the responsible sibling, and she is watching. Now, I realize we're not talking about the 21st century, but I would imagine that Miriam had other things that she would rather be doing than helping for three months hide her baby brother. And can you imagine? Now, we had four beautiful babies, the most beautiful babies I've ever seen, okay? But one in particular was a particularly crying, troublesome baby, okay? But all babies tend to cry, and sometimes at the most inopportune times, mm, 2 o'clock in the morning, and then again at 3 o'clock in the morning, and then they don't go right back to sleep right away, all right? What was it like to hide that baby for three months? Can you imagine what it took? And babies can have iron lungs, if you know what I mean. They can really let it go. And they hid him for three months. Imagine what Miriam had to go through for three months. And then her mom says, you go watch him down by the river. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know about you. And I know this is not the 21st century, but nowadays, kids find all kinds of excuses to get out of work. Now, sometimes it's adults as well. We're not always innocent of this. But kids are particularly adept at finding excuses for not doing work. It's amazing sometimes how the trash can can be overflowing and they find another space for something else to go in the trash, but no one will take the trash out. It's somebody else's responsibility, even though there's now trash falling on the floor. You know, you name it, right? You say it five times and the same job is not done. Somebody has to put the dishes in the dishwasher, empty the sink, and put the dishes in the dishwasher. And there's gross things in the sink, and so nobody wants to do it. And then there's all the different chores around the house, and then there's the yard that needs to be mowed. On and on and on we could go. And nowadays, in our 21st century America, we have all kinds of screens. There's all kinds of entertainment. I mean, there's a thousand things that we could entertain ourselves with. Who would ever want to do any kind of work around the house when there's YouTube, and all kinds of internet websites and 150,000 channels on the live streaming TV. But just imagine for a minute, Miriam, could she have maybe found something else to do besides watch her baby brother? Besides after three months of trying to hide him, now she's the one who has to go down by the river in the hot Egyptian sun and watch, I don't know what kind of bugs, mosquitoes and everything else that she had to endure while she's peeking through the bulrushes trying to find out what's going to happen. And then can you imagine what's going through her mind as she's thinking, what happens if somebody comes and wants to take my baby brother? What happens if the basket tips over? What happens if, a, I don't know, a crocodile? I'm assuming that there were crocodiles in, in the Nile. I haven't watched a National Geographic for a while, and I didn't look this up on Encyclopedia Britannica or anything, but I think there's not, uh, crocodiles in, in the Nile. Can you imagine what she's thinking? What if a crocodile comes and starts to peek around, poke around at this basket? What am I going to do as a little girl, as a big sister? How am I going to take on the crocodile? What do I say to my parents when the crocodile eats my baby brother? I mean, these, these are just, I'm, I know I have a wild imagination sometimes, but I'm trying to imagine what it's like for Miriam to be standing there, and she doesn't know how long or what she's going to do. And then, of course, we know 
Pharaoh's daughter, and in the providence of God, she hears baby Moses crying, and Pharaoh's daughter realizes that there is a baby, and her heart is touched, and she wants to save this baby alive, and what does Miriam do? Hi, Pharaoh's daughter. <laughs> you know what Pharaoh's daughter does, right? She says, or you know what Miriam does. She says, I know somebody who can take care of this baby. As a matter of fact, would you like for me to go find somebody to help take care of the baby? And Pharaoh's daughter is like, yeah, that's a great idea. Think of the wisdom. Think of what Miriam went through. All those things that she was thinking about and that she was worried about, and then all of a sudden, boom, Pharaoh's daughter is having sympathy upon this child, maybe gets it out of the basket, and Miriam jumps to the occasion, and she is a smart girl, very smart, as most girls are, much smarter than their little brothers. And she is very wise, and she is given, obviously, great wisdom from God, but she is prepared, she is thinking of her baby brother. She cares for him. She cares about the Lord. She wants to save him alive. She has a heart of compassion, of responsibility, and God blesses her with wisdom, and she approaches the Pharaoh's daughter. Now, how intimidating would that have been for a little girl to go up to the king, the king's daughter, the king who has commanded that this little baby brother should be dead, and she has enough courage to go to the Pharaoh's daughter and say, can I help? I know somebody who can take care of this little baby. And of course, who does she go back to? She goes back to her mom and says, hey, mom, Pharaoh's daughter is here and she needs somebody to take care of Moses. And I have just talked to her. And of course, Pharaoh's daughter then hires Jochebed and she gets paid to take care of her own baby boy. Now, some moms are thinking, that's a great deal. I didn't get paid anything to take care of my, you know. <laughs> but what a joy to not only see him alive, but then to get paid by the Pharaoh's daughter, who her own father had given the command for him to be dead. Amazing the providence of God, and amazing how God used Miriam in such a special way here. So we have some lessons that we can learn from just this event. God expects children to be obedient and respectful to their parents. That can be the hardest thing to do sometimes. Just simply obey. Just do what mom and dad say to do. Do it right away, do it completely, and do it sweetly. And sometimes we can obey completely and we can obey quickly, but this is the hardest part, obeying sweetly. We have an attitude about it. We stomp around. We get a grumpy spirit, and we're like that little girl or little boy who says, I may be standing up on the, ins on the outside, but I am sitting down on the inside. And there are times where we obey, but we're not obeying with the right heart spirit, the right heart attitude. But we see in Miriam a willingness. She obeyed. She honored her parents, she honored the Lord, she feared God, and God gave her great wisdom. We see that God uses people of all different ages and backgrounds in various circumstances to accomplish his will. We just need to be willing. We just need to be servants. We just need to obey God. We just need to say, like Samuel, here am I, Lord, send me. And just do what we know is the next right thing to do. And sometimes that can be the hardest thing. But I don't know, and I want to be seen, or I want to, what's, what's in it for me? How much am I going to get paid? Right? What am I going to get in return? Am I going to get an ice cream? Am I going to get a candy bar? And parents often remind the kid, who brought you into this world? Who pays for the bills? Who puts the food on the table? Who puts the clothes on your back? Sometimes we have to go through those reminder moments, right? As parents and grandparents, we have to remind them that we're, we're taking care of a lot of things. And for us to ask you to do a simple chore, a few things around the house, and eventually, of course, as they get older, we may involve some allowance or we may pay them for certain things. But Miriam obeyed, and she was used of the Lord as a sister at a young age. And really, if you think about it, as we were just talking about, in some ways, 
It was a life or death kind of situation. She didn't know how Pharaoh's daughter was going to react. Pharaoh's daughter was obviously, as the daughter of the king who had made the decree, it could have been totally different. But Miriam was willing. She feared God. She trusted God. And God used her. And we see even a small act of obedience, when rewarded by God, can pay lifelong dividends. Because what did Moses grow up to be? He ended up being the leader of Israel, leading them in, in the wilderness, out of Egypt. And Miriam was a big part of that by being there at that river that day and helping keep her baby brother alive. Where did Miriam learn these character traits? A lesson for us as parents and as grandparents. A lesson for us as, influ- as, as people who are influential in the lives of young people. Where did Miriam learn these character traits? She learned them at home. Where did she learn to honor and to fear God? Where did she learn to think through situations and to be responsible and to be loyal and to be God-fearing and to be obedient and to have compassion? Where did she learn all these things? She learned them at home. She probably saw them modeled by her mom and dad. No doubt they had had discussions about how Moses was going to be kept alive. They were going to do everything in their power because we're going to obey God. We're not going to obey man in this respect because man's law is in direct violation to God's law. So we are going to obey God's law. And Miriam learned that at home. So it gave her the resolve. It gave her the character to obey God and to do what was right in that situation. So that's her obedience and her wisdom. And then in Exodus chapter 15, you may have to turn a few pages in our Bibles to Exodus 15, verses 20 and 21. We see in Exodus 15, the song of Moses, as they were delivered from the Egyptians through the Red Sea. And we see Miriam in Exodus 15 and verse 20. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Miriam was a prophetess. She led the women in a song of praise and thanksgiving. Now, as a prophetess, we have to remember that this means a woman given the privilege of delivering the word of God under certain, under certain circumstances. It does not mean that this is an office in the church. It doesn't mean that she was a source of divine revelation. It just simply means that she had been given a teaching or a leadership responsibility in delivering the word of God in certain circumstances. In this case, she led the women in this song of praise and thanksgiving as the Israelites were delivered from the Egyptians through the Red Sea. And I know that everybody wants to talk about the song and the dance, okay? But let's begin by, first of all, talking about her leadership. Her leadership began where? With service. Serving her mom and dad, serving her baby brother, serving her brothers Aaron and Moses in the ministries that she was given to Israel. She was a servant first, and then as she was faithful in the little things, God gave her the responsibility and the faithfulness in the bigger things. And now she's leading these women in this time of thanksgiving, of praise and thanksgiving. But let's just take a minute and think about the fact that her dancing was not inappropriate, nor was it prescriptive. There is too much in this world today of ladies, women, girls, and it's not just girls, men are guilty of it as well, but there is far too much dancing in our culture today that is provocative, sensual, and just downright dirty. And what is portrayed on TV and on the social media apps, and I'm not here to be all condemning of every single little movement, and we used to have the saying growing up, keep it vertical, keep it vertical, okay? And I'm not gonna use all the modern terms I want to be discreet here, but you know what I mean. 
And there are all kinds of dances nowadays, and they're nothing but provocative. They are deliberately patterned after a certain kind of physical conduct that when not done in the bounds of marriage, in the bonds of marriage, it is immoral. Okay? Do I need to say it any differently? And it is immoral when that kind of body movement is practiced for entertainment. And there is a social media app, and I'm not here to, just, again, be all condemning of TikTok, but TikTok is the, from what I understand, the number one social media app. But I would venture to say that the vast majority of the dancing that goes on on TikTok is not appropriate. Okay? And men's minds are going to go a certain place when a woman, a girl, moves her body in a certain way. And I'm going to say it at that, and I'm going to leave it at that. That is not the dancing that Miriam was doing. This was not a provocative, sensual dance to get the men to think wrong thoughts. Okay? This was an appropriate dance, and it was not prescriptive of what we are supposed to be doing on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights and Wednesday nights in church. Berean Baptist Church does not have a dance team. And we're not going to have a dance team as long as I'm the pastor. Okay? So, I don't think there's anybody here pushing for a dance team. Don't get me wrong, okay? <laughs> but we're not doing a dance team. And what do they call them? Praise and worship? Dance teams? Anyway. It's not prescriptive. It was not done inappropriately. That's her praise and thanksgiving. Her praise and thanksgiving was to God. It was a praise and thanksgiving focused upon what God had done, not upon performance, not upon selfish, sensual, self-serving activity. It was a praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. We close tonight with what we have to address with Miriam. A godly woman served the Lord faithful in so many ways, but this is a testimony once again to the inspiration and the authority of God's word because God's word is very clear even when his people sin. And if the Bible were a human book, there would be a lot of these kinds of things glossed over, eliminated, avoided. But the Bible is the inspired word of God. So God is very clear sometimes when godly men and women fail. We know it with David, with Solomon, with other Bible characters. Miriam was greatly used of the Lord. Testimony of faithfulness, responsibility of service, of leadership, praise and thanksgiving. But we get to Numbers chapter number 12. Numbers chapter number 12. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. They were in the throes of rebellion against God's ordained leadership. Now, from this, at this point, our understanding is that Moses' first wife, Zipporah, had died. And he had remarried now to this Ethiopian woman, this Cushite woman. And for whatever reason, we're not told specifically, it could have to do simply uh, with the, the, the prophetic activity that was going on in chapter 11. And now Miriam and Aaron felt threatened. They felt like there were other people now who had been used of the Lord in teaching and prophesying. I, we're not sure. We don't know if it was a jealousy and an envy. We don't know if it was a frustration that Miriam had with the uh, wilderness challenges, but nevertheless, she turned on Moses, and it appears that she was the leader, and Aaron was once again the follower. Because remember, Aaron had been a follower before, when the golden calf, when Moses was up in Mount Sinai receiving the law, and the people came, and they were agitating and instigating Aaron to... Do something, because Moses is up there, and he's been up there a long time, and maybe God's forgotten us, and what do the people talk Aaron into? And remember what Aaron said? Well, I got all the gold from them, all their jewelry, and I threw it in the fire, and boom, presto, changeo, magic. This golden calf came out. How did that happen? We know that Moses, excuse me, that Aaron was involved in that. He gave in. He was 
just as compromising as the people. It appears that Aaron got talked into this by his sister Miriam, because she's the one that gets the greatest consequence, the leprosy. It doesn't say that Aaron did. So apparently she instigated this rebellion. And in verse 10 of Numbers 12, she is struck with leprosy. God deals with her severely. But what does Aaron do? He repents on their behalf. Aaron calls out to the Lord. Aaron said unto Moses in verse 11 of Numbers 12, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And then Moses prays. He pleads with God. Verse 13, And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and after that let her be received in again. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. And afterward the people removed from Hazareth and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. Reminder that even godly people can be plagued by pride and get trapped by sin. But we also see God's forgiveness, God's mercy. He didn't leave her with leprosy that she died, that she ended up being in a leper's camp and suffering the rest of her life and dying a leper. But for seven days she had to be set outside the camp. She no doubt contemplated her rebellion. Aaron had repented, and I believe Miriam was right along with him. He was the voice, but I believe she was right there with him, saying, yes, yes, yes. And as Moses cried out and pleaded, I can't help but think, what did Moses, as he's praying, as he's thinking about maybe Miriam helping save him as a baby. Now he is praying, pleading, crying out to the Lord, begging for her. And she is given mercy seven days outside the camp. And can I just finish with this, that there's something special about Aaron and Moses and Miriam, brothers and sisters who God used, who loved the Lord, and they had their issues, no doubt, but they loved each other, and they cared for each other. And I'm thankful for a sister who cared for me, who still cares for me. I'm thankful that we have a good relationship. She wrote me faithfully when I was in college. Uh, we, we were talking last night. I was praying for her. She had a very important meeting. Uh, this morning at her work, uh, we text and correspond, tell each other we're praying for one another. Kelly's got a great relationship with her sister. What a blessing to have brothers and sisters. And encourage each other to do right. When a brother or sister is acting out and being a brat and being disobedient, encourage your brother or sister to do right. Give them a little nudge gently and say, hey, have you thought about it? You know what? Mom and dad are going through a lot right now. Things are really tough. Do you really think that we should be doing this? We're just making life a little bit too hard for them when they already have a lot on their plate. Encourage one another and pray for one another. Miriam was prayed for. No doubt she prayed for Moses, not knowing what was going to happen to him in the Nile River. And Moses is pleading. Aaron is repenting along with Miriam. They're praying. They're crying out. Pray for one another as brothers and sisters. Cry out to God for one another. Some of you brothers and sisters are going to go off to camp this summer. And you're going to be in camp and hearing the same preaching. And you can be praying for one another that God will do a work in hearts. Um, pay attention in church. Don't be goofing off and taking, you know, drawing. Some of you are, 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 are doodle experts, if you know what I mean. And I'm not saying you can't pay attention and do some drawing. I, I would do my little drawings growing up. But pay attention to the word of God. Listen to what God has to say. Listen to mom and dad. Get, get out of the glowing rectangles and listen. Take those earbuds out and listen. Mom and dad have some wisdom, have some good things. Miriam listened to her mom and dad, and she was used of the Lord. And no doubt Moses and Aaron listened to their, moms and their mom and dad, and they were used of the Lord. So a lot here from the life of Miriam that I hope has been an encouragement to us. And may the Lord bless his word in our hearts and lives tonight. Thank you for being here, for being faithful. Let's pray and then we'll be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful family that you used. Brothers and sister who, yes, they probably had their disagreements. Miriam, even later in life, turned on her brother. But Lord, they 
received forgiveness. They experienced your mercy. Lord, they served together. They went through hard times together. They prayed for one another. They even helped save each other's lives. They went through the good times and the bad times together. But Lord, they kept their eyes on you. They loved you. And they kept you first. And Lord, may our young people grow up as sons and daughters, as brothers and sisters. Lord, may they put these Bible principles into their lives to honor and obey mom and dad, to love you, to serve you, to pray for one another, to help encourage each other to do what's right, and to live for you. We thank you, Lord, for these principles from your word. May we apply them, live them out. And we thank you, Lord, for our time together again tonight. We give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.